Welcome aboard, shipmates. This is Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, a training program created for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps by our friends and supporters at the Navy Talent Acquisition Group in Philadelphia. I'm your host, Warrant Officer David Cheek of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, and I am joined today by my all-Navy crew of MC1 Quinlan, who's our Public Affairs Officer, STG1 Lewifin, who is our Technical Support Director, and also from the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, Ensign DePippo, who is our Talent Scout. So today, cadets, we have a fantastic presentation for you today, and it's all about being a diver in the United States Navy. Now, many of you have asked about this because we do a whole bunch of training over the summer, and dive school is one of the big things that our cadets really enjoy. So today, we're going to learn all about being a Navy diver from our guest today, Petty, uh, Chief Petty Officer Brian Huffman from EOD Group 2. So, Chief, thank you very much for coming in and being part of our presentation today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Warren. Happy to be here. And uh, Cadet, you know, this is, as you know, every single time, you know, with our live presentation, when you have questions, and I know that you do, right? Put them in the comments section, either if you're watching here on YouTube or if you're watching on the Facebook site, put them there. We'll work them into the conversations and we'll make sure that the chief is able to respond to all the great things you want to know about Navy diving. Also, just like every presentation, we have that online quiz. So as soon as the live presentation's over, Give us a moment to relax, take a breath, and then we'll post that URL up there, take the quiz, get two hours of virtual credit while you reinforce what you learned today. So it's a great deal and a fantastic to comment uh, or comment on what you wanna know, get those fantastic comments out there and we'll take care of them right away. So without any further delay, Chief, this presentation is all yours. Take it away. All right, thank you, Warren. Okay, everybody, so again, I'm a Chief Navy Diver, Brian Huffman. Like Warren said, I'm assigned to EOD Group 2 here in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Next slide, please. A little bit about myself from a small town in North Carolina called Welcome. I've uh, been in the Navy is for- real, Is it really named Welcome? Is that that? Yes, sir. There's even a sign that says "Welcome to Welcome." As you understand. Okay. okay. Is it anywhere near the water? No, sir. It's about in the middle of the state. Uh, okay. If you're familiar with the state, Winston-Salem is probably the closest big city I could point you to. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. So I've uh, been in the Navy for 17 years. I've been a diver for a little over 15 of those years. Um, started out in aviation before I, I went into diving. Uh, reason I joined the Navy, uh, great opportunity to see the world. And I've, I've got to do that during this last 17 years. Um, some of the best things about my job, again, seeing the world, the travel is, is amazing. We go all over the place. Uh, and also diving, it's a, it's a very tight knit community. There's not a lot of us, you know, we typically work in small groups. So there's a lot of good uh, camaraderie in the Navy diving community. So back, back to your, your you know, your upbringing in, in uh, Welcome, North Carolina. That is really so cool. Um, since you're nowhere near the ocean, why the Navy? Is it, is, do you have a family connection or what, what drove you to be interested in the Navy and not some other branch of the service? No, sir. No, uh, no family members in the Navy. Uh, I just saw the, you know, the Navy is the best opportunity out of all the branches to, you know, like I said, to travel, see the world. And uh, diving, it just really interested me. So I think okay. that's what into that route. Okay. I bet you said you, start, you said you started off in aviation, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So what, what did you do in aviation, if you don't mind me asking? I was an uh, undesignated airman. I was assigned to a uh, EA-6B Prowler Squadron in Whidbey Island, Washington. Oh, okay. Well, that's a pretty cool route. It was a good time. I did it for just around two years, I believe, before mm -hmm. I went to law school. Okay, very nice. Okay, please continue. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no worries. Uh, I'd say my top Navy memory, it's going back about 14 years, but I, I was stationed on the USS Salvor while on deployment. We went to the uh, Gulf of Thailand. There we made a, a, a series of dives over the course of a week to help uh, identify a World War II sub that was uh, thought to have been sunk in the Gulf of Thailand. So as you can see in the PowerPoint, I made a, I made two 240 foot dives to help uh, identify what turned out to be the uh, USS Legardo that was sank there. Wow. So 
How, how did they make that determination it was there in the first place? Because I'm sure they just don't randomly say, let's go diving and see what we can. That would be part of something. So I guess the Navy knew it was lost somewhere in that area. And over mm -hmm. the over the years, Thai fishermen had reported losing nets in a, a specific area. Okay. And uh, some civilian wreck divers had uh, actually discovered it. So we came in, went down, and uh, threw some of the, the uh, serial number on the propeller, we were able to determine that it was in fact the uh, USS Legardo. Wow, wow. What, how, how good of a shape was it in? Was it pretty recognizable or did it over time start to decompose? It was, co it was covered in fishing nets. So <laughs> okay. you, could, you could see that it was a, it was a submarine. It was, uh, it was identifiable. It wasn't in, really in pieces. It was pretty much intact. Besides that, you know, it obviously sustained damage, but uh, yeah, after all those years, it was still recognizable as a submarine. Wow. Okay. And and the submariners are really, you know, they, they hold that to be very true. You know, they're they're very, um, you know, sentimental and uh, very proud of, especially their 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 brothers that did not come back from the war. So I'm sure that was very uh, important to them to know that that was there, and also for their families. Absolutely. Wow, that's great. Thank you. So as far as my previous assignments, uh, like I already said, uh, Electronic Attack Squadron 142, that was the uh, EA-6B Prowler Squadron in Woodby Island, Washington. Um, from there, I went to dive school and my, reported to my first dive command, which was the uh, USS Salvor, which was located in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I was actually uh, decommissioned that ship. And from there, I went over to uh, Yokosuka, Japan, to the ship repair facility over there. After that, made my way back to Hawaii to uh, SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 1. Continued in Hawaii <laughs> to Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. Okay. And I started my uh, move east, uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Maintenance Centers here in Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, well, my, you, you definitely don't have to be shy about saying you spent all that great amount of time in Hawaii. So, uh, hey, that's just one of the benefits of the job, right? It's not Absolutely. your best. Okay. It's been, a, it's been a lot of time on islands. Whidbey Island, Washington, Hawaii, Japan. So started making my way back to the, the lower 48 slowly. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a, a brief history, obviously not the entire history of uh, Navy diving, but as a rate, we, uh, we've only been a rate since 2006. So we've only been a rate for uh, 14 years. Prior to that, divers were still around, but they, uh, you still, you would have a, another rate in the Navy, but you would, you would still be a diver. You would still work as a diver, but when you were taking say advancement exams, it would be on uh, whatever rate you, you were serving as. Um, you know, we go all the way back to like the late 1800s. There was evidence of divers. Um, some of the big things we've done, we've taken part in the largest salvage operation ever, which was after uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked during World War II. Um, you know, during Vietnam, we cleared harbors and waterways. We have some of the big salvage uh, missions the Navy divers have accomplished. We've uh, recovered items from TWA Flight 800, uh, Swiss Air Flight 111, and portions of the uh, Titan IV spacecraft. Uh, 2002, uh, divers from Mobile Diving Salvage Unit 2 took part in salvaging portions of the, uh, the USS Monitor. See, that is really, really interesting, you know, as far as like, you know, you know, with all the, the, the different areas that you, you know, that the rate has been able to cover, but, you know, going and supporting the the, the monitor that's that's got to be you know pretty interesting diving just because it's such an old artifact and cadets that's a one of the first ironclad ships of the civil war i mean it's been underwater that long so you know there's a I, i'm sure there's a whole bunch of safety protocols you'd have to do in order just to to interact with that vessel oh definitely and that was some uh, deep diving as well so they they had to employ they had to employ a, a different type of diving known as mixed gas diving where you you take the nitrogen out of uh, the air and replace it with uh, helium to allow you to go to deeper depths. Okay. And, and about how far down was that? They were inside of 300 feet. Uh, wow. I could, 
to get back to you on the actual depth. So greater than 200, definitely. Somewhere between okay. two and 300, we'll say. Probably about 250. We'll just follow okay. in the middle. <laughs> So, you know, based upon, you know, your experience, how, how deep did you dive before? I'd say my deepest dive has been 240 feet. That was also a mixed gas dive. Okay. So when do you actually start moving to a, a mixed gas dive? After uh, 190 feet. You can okay. go on air down to 190. Anything after that, it'll become uh, mixed gas diving. Okay. All right. Interesting. So what's going on in these pictures? Okay, so the top picture that is a uh, that is a dry deck shelter which is on top of a submarine. That's um, seal de seal delivery vehicle team uh, diving operations. There's a essentially a mini sub that goes inside that shelter. You see those guys standing in. They roll it out on a like a cradle mm -hmm. and seal, launch the seals out from that. So those are probably all divers there. They're probably waiting to recover the uh, seal delivery vehicle at that point. And, you know, that, that's, a, you know, that adds one of the questions is that, you know, in the previous slide, you were talking about working with, with the SEALs and stuff. So, you know, if the SEALs are using this equipment, you know, I'm kind of thinking they're divers too. So what's, the, what's the relationship between a Navy diver doing this type of thing and then, say, a SEAL supporting it? Are they, you know, I guess you're mutually supporting each other through this activity, right? Well, we're definitely supporting them, sir, in this, uh, this activity. We're the ones that help them get out you know basically get them out of the shelter so they can go do their mission and then when they're done we're, we're standing by to recover them and get them back in get them back inside the sub oh, okay all right that makes sense excellent so then uh, if, if you take a look at the bottom left it's just a diver he's using a uh under he's just doing underwater cutting he's uh, looks like they're removing old anchor chains probably from uh an old buoy or something they're replacing the chains on them. So we're, uh, he's, uh, he's also diving, uh, that's surface supply diving there with the helmet. That's a, it's called a KM 37. That's uh, on his head. And when I say surface supply diving, that means he has an umbilical, essentially an air hose that goes to the surface to an air system that provides him uh, his breathing air. Okay. All right. Excellent. And then the, the bottom right, I believe those guys are probably doing training for what they call AT, ATFP diving, anti-terrorism force protection diving. It's a type of diving that EOD and uh, Navy divers do. Essentially, you have a pier, a barge, or a tugboat that's going to touch a USS vessel. Uh, before it can touch, you know, that Navy vessel, divers would go down. They'll, you know, or EOD uh, sweep the pier, looking for any uh, any kind of hazards, like any kind of underwater ordnance, you know, explosives, mines, what whatnot. Uh, same thing with a, like say a tugboat or a barge before uh, those items would touch the vessel. So they do that all over the world, uh -huh. anywhere, pretty much anywhere a navy ship is pulling in. That's not a, a military port. You're gonna you're gonna see that when uh, the hospital ships went to uh, L.A. and to New York City for COVID response. They had to send uh, divers and EOD techs to go sweep those piers as well before those ships could pull in. Really? No kidding. Now, do they do the same thing when, like, for example, I was involved with Fleet Week New York and they brought a couple of ships up to New York for each one of those locations. Do they do the same thing if it's a public pier? Yes, sir. Really? Okay. I guess it's so clandestine that, you know, those of us who are not in the know don't even notice it's happening. So, uh, yeah, you maybe probably that's... notice they're there. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. So one, one of our cadets is asking, and this is, is a good thing. So, you know, you, you were interested in diving and, and you moved forward in that pipeline for training. But, you know, when you took your first dive, all right, was your first dive that you ever did, was it in the Navy or did you do it prior to, to the Navy? I made a couple of recreational dives when I was deployed to Okinawa, Japan, when I was still in aviation. Right. Um, maybe I'd say less than 10 dives probably. So I didn't have really any, I wouldn't say I had any significant experience going into dive school, but okay. previous okay. experience isn't required uh, okay. before you go. And were you hooked at that point in time? You're like, this is so cool. Well, definitely there in Okinawa, water's crystal clear. There's, you know, right. beautiful uh, reefs and marine life there. Mm -hmm. 
So, so to, to drill into this cadet's question in particular is like, okay, so the first time you did it, were you were you nervous and scared, and how did you move forward from that, or was it just completely natural to you, like this is just the way it is? Um, I would say it was, you know, again, you know, you're doing the your first dives. It's in clear water. There's no current. You know, good visibility. The water is relatively warm. Right. So it, you know, I, I think I was pretty comfortable. If you were somewhere, you know, with, with all the opposite of what I just said, you know, cold, murky water with a you're dealing right. with a sea state, it might have been a, it might have been a different story. Okay. Good. All right. Perfect introduction. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Our spectrum of potential work is above and beyond almost any other rate in the Navy. We uh, do underwater ships husbandry. We do salvage and uh, special warfare support. We can also do a lot of deployments. We go all over the world. That's kind of our motto is we dive the world over. Underwater ships husbandry is the uh, repair and maintenance of underwater holes and hole appendages on Navy ships. We might need to go down and perform some kind of structural repair. It's a large part of Navy diving. Salvage, that's when we're going to do walking on the bottom, deep diving, the real down and dirty kind of diving that Navy diving is known for. If a plane or a jet were to go down down the middle of the ocean, you know, Navy divers have to go get it. We officially verified a sunken U.S. vessel in Indonesia that was a war grave from World War II. U.S. Navy divers responded to the bridge collapse in Minnesota. Navy divers helped with the aftermath of Katrina. Navy divers helped with recovery efforts in the Philippines and Haiti and the Caribbean and South and Central America, all over Asia. I've salvaged a tank. I've done numerous helicopters. I've deployed to, to places that I didn't even know where they were on the map. And there's guys that do way above anything that I've ever done. The job satisfaction with being a diver is, is immense. I think honestly what pushes me about this community is the people, the divers, the SEALs, the EOD that I've had the opportunity to work along with. That has definitely been the biggest motivation for me. That's pretty great stuff. So let, if, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about the pipeline. Like, how do you begin? So, I mean, in your case in particular, you know, you were, you were in aviation, right? Then, right. you know, then you had an aspiration to be a Navy diver. So how did that progress for you to go, okay, I want to do this, right? You know, how do you get the schooling? What was the schooling like in order to get you, you know, out in the fleet doing this at, at your vocation? So, like I said, I was already in the fleet, spoke mm -hmm. with uh, command career counselor. Uh, I was luck luckily there was a EOD mobile unit on Whidbey Island. So I went and spoke with them. They had a dive locker there. So they gave me uh, a screening test, a physical screening test. I did a dive physical with their medical department and mm -hmm. uh, ultimately a uh, hyperbaric pressure test. Once all that was uh, accomplished, I put it together in a package and submitted it and you know, a few months later, I found out that I was accepted to go to dive school. That's how I did it from the fleet. Okay. Uh, obviously, you can do it. You can come in and go straight to dive school as well. Yeah, that, that was my understanding as well. And like the physical component with this is, I mean, this is one of your your high uh, physical activity rates, right? So you had to do a significant amount of training just to qualify. Is that... Is that correct? All right. There's the physical screening test consists of a timed swim using side stroke or breaststroke, mm -hmm. push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, and a timed mile and a half run. Okay. So that's that's when I say physical screening test. That's what that's okay. part of your requirements to to get into dive school, and you'll do it throughout dive school as well. Okay. Um, and then the initial dive school. Where is that located? It's in Panama City, Florida. Okay. So then, after you pass this and you're and you're accepted into the program, you went directly to Panama City, Florida to start your training and diving. 
Yes, sir. Okay. So what was day one like? Oh, uh, day one. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, they, they treat you so nicely, I'm sure. Right. It's a, it's a, <laughs> you get an introduction to all the instructors. Right. And then pretty much the first thing you do is that physical screening test. Because right. if you don't pass that, then you're probably not, your, your, your training is probably not going to go on from there. Right. Uh, after right. you finish that, it's just a nice, nice long workout. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, you know, they, they, you're introduced to everybody. It's nice, relaxing. No, not at all, right? They just grind you in the dirt to see if you can take it, right? Yeah, the first day, it'll definitely be a wake-up call for everyone. <laughs> but you know what? And that's fine, right? Because it, 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 it starts to, I wouldn't say weed people out, but definitely shows, you know, who's motivated to stay, right? And who can put up with the training. Because you only need the best in order to do this, right? Right. I think they're really looking for the, the motivated. It's not necessarily to weed someone out, but like you said, they're looking right. for the, everyone who has the most motivation. Absolutely. So then, you know, with, with all this training, clearly you have to train continuously, right? So what is your like routine training um, activities look like right now? Because you've been in for quite a while, right? You, right. you know, you've advanced up through that. You, you're, you're, clearly accomplished but training never ends right right so for training you know it can depend on what kind of command you're at mm -hmm. so for example if you're at a, a shipyard doing underwater ship's husbandry training you're, you're really you're diving every day so every day you're you're learning so there's a job that comes up and you're not familiar with it you, you would dive with someone that is and you basically you know you would just learn on the job with a lot of it certain um Certain jobs, you know, bigger jobs, you know, we may go through some classroom training as a, as a team going over some procedures to make sure everybody's, you know, on the same page with what we're going to do. If you were at, say, one of our salvage units, they go through perpetual, it seems like, uh, training cycles for, you know, whatever type of uh, diving apparatus they're using. Right. To, you know, they could be doing a, a salvage project. They could be doing training dives for the anti-terrorism force protection dives I spoke of. Mm -hmm. Anything, anything like that, they'll go through uh, pretty extensive training cycles to accomplish all that. Okay. Uh, same so, with special or support. Right. And, and in your in your experience, did you do all of those things or you just do some of those things like specialized in particular areas of that? So I've done salvage when I was on the USS Salvor, my, mm -hmm. my spec war support has been um, SDV Team 1. I did several shipyards, so I've gotten plenty of uh, underwater ship seismic training. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sounds like you, you know, love it. Okay. So, you know, as far as access, and I, I actually never heard that term before until we started having this presentation, right? Underwater ship husbandry. But, you know, yeah, so you're involved with doing the underwater welding and all that type of portion as, as well? Most of the underwater uh, ship's husband we do, um, so for example, you have a surface ship, we install patches underneath them. Uh, we call them coffer dams. It's a way of separating the, the sea from inside the ship. So if the ship had to replace, um, let's say, a valve inside for a, a pump, if right, they pull right. that valve off without our coffer dam on it, they're going to flood that space. So mm -hmm. we put a patch um to prevent that from happening. I'm, when I say patch, it could be, uh, it could be as simple as a wooden uh, plug hammered into a, a opening on a discharge to coffer dams that are as big as your car. It just depends on what size, what size vessel you're working on and what, what type of system. We can change out propellers and propeller blades underwater on surface ships. We can remove propellers on submarines. There's uh, just a, plethora of work you can do on a submarine underneath it and inside of it from underwater. Wow. So wow. it keeps us, uh, keeps us pretty busy at, at shipyards. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, that, that's pretty intense. Thank you. So the video kind of already said this, but what I do as a Navy diver, so we perform underwater salvage repair and maintenance on ships and submarines, submarine rescue support, uh, and, and support to Naval Special Warfare, EOD, and uh, Marine Special Operations. 
you know, using a variety of diving equipment. We also main and maintain and repair all of our own systems. And also in the video, it's, it said our motto is we dive the world over. Yeah, absolutely. So um, here's fine. some, uh, here's some photos of me. Um, most, yeah. of these are, most of these are pretty old. The, uh, the top left, that's on the USS Salvor, the, the World War II dive I spoke of earlier. That's, that's me coming up from one of those dives. I'm the one uh, on the stage facing in the, in the picture. Okay, so they'll, they'll, they'll take you down in that and you'll ride that on the way down. You don't have to swim down and swim back up, right? This is me being a non-diver novice. So well, you, you could you could do both, sir. Uh, it's it's preferable to ride the stage. It just depends on what you're doing. If you're diving off of a barge and you don't have a a crane or a davit to put a stage on, you could throw a well. They'll always throw a line in the water on a weighted, you know, with a weight on the end, right? And that's what the the stage will connect to and ride down. So if there was no stage, or let's say the stage uh, stopped working, you would just hand over hand coming up that, or the the guys on the surface could. Uh, could haul you up as well. Okay. Just, not not every dive would you have the luxury of that stage, though. <laughs> All right. So that's the Cadillac. I got it. So then if you move it on to the uh, top right, that's the same deployment uh, on the Salvor. We would go basically to all these different countries in Southeast Asia and dive with that country's Navy. And in this picture, we're in uh, Thailand diving with the Royal Thai Navy. So these are Thai Navy divers that are, uh, they come on board with us and we'll go out to sea and dive with them so they can get some training. Maybe they don't have the opportunity to dive out at sea as much or use that kind of equipment. So we, we expose them to that. So I was just helping in the picture, I'm helping someone get a, get dressed for the dive. So how would you compare their training uh, as compared to say your training? Because every, every country I'm sure does it differently, right? right. So, so do you have, an, an area of like concern when you're going with, with different navies working there? You don't have to be specific because we're not trying to pick on anybody, but you know, uh, do you know that there's like different standards and then you have to, you know, be aware or compensate or, or be on the lookout for things like that? Well, we're always aware of, you know, their training probably doesn't necessarily meet ours. Depends, you know, with yeah. our allies in Europe, you know, the, the Brits, you know, they're probably right on par with us, but you know, when you're going to some countries, that's why we're there to, like I said, to right. expose them to some gear that they might not normally have the opportunity to use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always use our gear. So they dive with, with only uh, our gear, but mm -hmm. uh, all the countries I went to, I, I thought they were, I felt that they were all pretty confident, confident, you know, to dive with, you know, Singapore, right. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. We went all over the place and dove with them. Okay. All right, that sounds great. Then uh, move to the bottom left. That's a it's a it was a career day for the high school on base in Yokosuka, Japan. So I got asked to come and speak about navy diving, kind of like what I'm doing right now, okay. but with the students at the high school there on base. All right. So what do you have on the table there? It looks like a tank, but what's the rest of the stuff? So I got my hand on what was called a, a Mark 21. It's the same helmet I got on in the picture above. It's a surface applied helmet. It's uh, there's a newer version of that now. Like I said, this is this picture is probably 12, 13 years old. Okay. <laughs> so, right. so these kids, so everyone's uh, definitely out of high school by now. Oh yeah. Uh, so I had that on the on the end of the table. I have a. a a communications box. So what I was doing was I was allowing the students to put the helmet on, um, you know, just see how it filled, how, how much it weighed on their head. And they, uh, you know, they could talk to their classmates through that, that box. Okay. How heavy is that by the way? It was, man, that one's been a while. It's 20 some odd pounds. I couldn't give you okay. exactly. But in the water, it's fine. Once you put it on, once you get in the water, it's, it's not really noticeable, but. Okay. Yeah, you can definitely feel it's on your head on the surface, but it's not too bad. <laughs> sure. Yeah, if you don't notice there's 20 pounds on your head, you know, you have bigger problems. <laughs> and then the bottom right, I think that was, I think that was when I was on the Salvor as well. I couldn't tell you what country we were in uh, during that dive. It was, 
it was good visibility. It's about the only thing I can really tell you from the picture. Well, it definitely looks like good visibility, that's for sure. And speaking and of visibility, water. you know, there's a good timely question that one of the cadets are asking, and is, do you have to have good eyesight to be a Navy diver? You do. I think you. it has to be corrected to a certain uh, site. That's something I could definitely get back to you on, give you the, the, the actual requirement. Um, right. I don't think you can be colorblind. We do use a rebreather that has a, I think it's in another picture, but there's a, a light that mounts on their mask, like right here in front of your eye, and it's two lights and it flashes. Um, it, it's a red and green light, so if you're red and green colorblind, that you know, it might be difficult to uh, tell what's going on. Okay. okay. All right. Very nice. Um, excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So why, why don't I roll through some of their, uh, you know, additional questions because what we have been doing is, you know, doing them as we move forward. So, um, one of the terms people hear is a, a master diver. So can you, can you tell what it takes to be a master diver and what type of duties does a master diver perform? So if that's not a thing, I apologize. I'm oh, it's definitely thing. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you the, the whole rundown real quick. You have, you know, you go to dive school, Upon successful completion of dive school, you would become a second class diver. Um, usually you do two tours as a second class diver, and then you would go back to dive school for additional training. Upon completion of that, you'd be a first class diver. So after you become a first class diver, you're typically a you know, second class or first class petty officer. After you, uh, you, know, you become a chief petty officer, then you're eligible for master diver. That consists of taking a, a test and then you go down back down to dive school and you go through a series of evaluations. And upon successful completion of that, you'd be um, to be made a master diver. So what a master divers duties are, you know, they're going to be your subject matter expert at the command. They're going to be your um, typically your most your most senior diver you'll have. They'll be the one uh, responsible for qualifications. Uh, for all the the other divers, maintaining certifications for like our diving systems. Um, like I said, they're they're going to be your subject matter expert. Okay, well that's great. So uh, I'm assuming you're a master diver, there, Chief. I'm a no, sir. I'm a uh, first class diver. So okay, you can see. Well, screen's okay. backwards. Yeah, a second <laughs> class diver would just be the the old Mark V dive helmet. Right. First class diver has the the fish on it here. And okay. then the master diver would have seahorses on the side. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a bigger pin. That's how you would identify. Diving officers would actually have a similar pin to the master diver, but theirs would be gold. That'd be the only really difference. So, so now that we we broached upon that subject, okay. So I mean, yeah, you have enlisted divers. What what's really the difference between other than rank? What are the duties difference in between an officer diver and an enlisted diver? So diving officers, yes, you'll uh, typically see them yeah, at a shipyard. There'll be an mm -hmm. engineer, there'll be an engineering officer that went through dive school. So they'll work at a shipyard, you know, planning maintenance and what have you on uh, uh, various ships and submarines. Right. And you know, they'll just be able to provide some kind of technical input. Uh, on you know certain jobs and they're you know they're able to come dive on it with you. You'll okay. see them. You'll see them at shipyards. Uh, a lot of EOD officers are also um, diving officers. They would go through diving officer school before they would go 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 on to EOD school. So those those officers you'll see managing uh, EOD platoons or um, at the uh, salvage units. They can also be a uh, officer in charge for the, the, the companies at Mobile Diving Salvage Unit 1 and 2. Okay. Okay. Um, so <laughs> this is an interesting question. All right. Um, what if you want to be a diver, but you're not really a really good swimmer? Uh, is that – that's incompatible, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you definitely want to be, a, you know, a strong swimmer. You're going to definitely need to be comfortable in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, the physical screening test I spoke of earlier, you'll do that with 
either the side stroke or the breast stroke. That's your only two strokes you're allowed to do for the test. You're going to be required in dive school to do base swims. So it'd be like a thousand yard swim. Uh, sometimes you're just on your back, just kicking, you know, with fins on, you know, right. maybe a time evolution. Do you need to be like an Olympic swimmer? No, but you like, you know, like I said, you definitely need to be comfortable in the water. I would, you want to be strong with your uh, side stroke and, and breast stroke definitely for school. Yes. Um, now, do I, do I swim every time I dive? No, there's, you know, if you're walking on the bottom, there's no swimming involved at all. <laughs> it just depends on what kind of command you're at. Right. That totally makes sense. Uh, going back quite a few years, well, not quite a few years, but a few years. Okay. So um, when you were in high school, were, were you athletic in high school? And did that did that uh, help you with your decision of what what you wanted to do in in, in the service? Um, I think it probably had uh, you know may help me with my decision. Um, I didn't you know I didn't join the Navy right out of high school. I didn't play team sports. Okay. Like that I was uh, I was more into BMX bikes in my uh, my younger years. So okay, nothing wrong with that. That, and a lot of our cadets, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're not student athletes, right? They have a variety of, of alternative things that they do. You know, BMX is, you know, I'm sure one of them, right? So it, it's all a matter of, hey, if, if I wanted to do something like this, did I already have myself in a position where, you know, I'm like one of the high school jocks and I'm like on, on the big team and all that type of stuff? Or do I just need the, the, the the heart and the mental drive in order to, to move forward with this. Yeah. I'd say, you know, anybody could, can, can go through the program. It's, you know, there's, I've seen all types since I've been in, uh, like I said, you definitely need to be physically fit for the program, mm -hmm. but do you need to be a, a track star or on the swim team? No, it can be, you know, the whole, the whole job's not physical. There's definitely uh, physical parts to the job. Right. There's plenty of it, but there's, you know, not everything. It's just, you know, you got to be the fastest and strongest to do it. Right. Right. Understood. There's um, definitely a technical aspect to the job as well. So, I mean, the, the job itself, I mean, for those of us who are, uh, you know, air breathing, bald primates, uh, we're not used to operating underwater here, but, you know, you know, the, for what you do to me is is fascinating to a significant amount of confidence to do that, which I commend you for. Um, are there, were there times where you were diving or do you have an example of a dive that was like really, really hard and, and it didn't go right? And what do you do about it? Um, I can say I've definitely done some ship repair jobs that, that were quite physical, you know, when you're having to lug heavy stuff underwater, you know, or break a bolt loose. That's a prime example. If you're standing, you know, if you're trying to break a bolt loose, you're working on your car, you know, right. you're standing on the ground, you have a way of getting some leverage, but when there's nothing underneath you and you're just, you know, you're just finning, you know, just kicking your legs, you know, it becomes a challenge. You got to get more creative to find ways to, 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 you know, like, like I said, I get some leverage to break free a bolt, for example, you know, taking a propeller off or something like that. Right. I would think that'd be a really challenging job, particularly like taking off a propeller because we're talking a Navy ship. This isn't like, you know, a fishing boat, right? These are massive structures, which are incredibly heavy. So it has to be a team of you doing this, right? Um, for ship repair, we could have two to three divers in the water at a time. But, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you said, like, for example, again, the propeller, obviously way heavier than what any anybody could ever lift. So you're, there's a lot of rigging involved. There's definitely a crane um, that's right. going to be used in, in those kind of jobs. Same with salvage. You know, if you're pulling something off the bottom, it's going to get hooked up to something, whether it be lift bags to help bring it up, or you're going to connect it to a crane to lift it off the bottom. Now, do you practice those things ahead of time before you get in the water? What type of training do you have? Well, you know, since you know command, you'll typically do three years at it. Mm -hmm. So. You check in. There should be uh, someone that's already been there for a while that has that experience. So right. you know, you're, you're relying on that to some extent. That someone is, has done it before, and like I said earlier, had you never done you know said job propeller removal, 
you would go in with someone that has and they would they would be helping you you know to you know that's how you would learn essentially on the job with something like that okay yeah that, that it would seem to me that be a significant amount of on the job training in order to, to make that happen right but when you went and, and dove on that world war ii submarine right how do you, how would you train for something like that you just go down there and see what you can see. I mean, there has to be a whole bunch of planning to go into any one of these evolutions. Oh, definitely. There was a diving officer that had been planning that job. He was waiting for that deployment to come through that area. So okay. he could do that job. We, we brought a mixed gas system from mobile diving salvage unit one, along mm -hmm. with a couple of divers from that command and uh, to do that job. So, you know, we had guys on board that had experience with, with deep dives already. So, you know, that played a part in it as well. Okay. Um, of all the places you've traveled, uh, do you have a favorite? I'd say Japan's probably one of my favorite places I've been to. Okay. How come? Uh, it's just so different. You know, it's, a, it's another world over there. There's, there's plenty to do. You know, mm -hmm. there'll, never, there'll never be a short of things to do over there. It's easy to get around. It's a right. clean, it's a safe country. Great food. Can't beat the food. No, um, you, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. You so, know, would you get an opportunity to live in Japan or Hawaii, for example? I did a ton of time in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So, and then not only the diving, but just being around on, on shore and doing everything there. It's just like it, it is an amazing good time. See, cadets, you know, you, there. If that expression, you know, jo join the Navy, see the world, it's it's pretty true. Now, sometimes seeing the world may be the bottom of a ship doing ship husbandry, but it's part of the world, so it's all cool. Um, so if you had the opportunity to do something different in the Navy, would you and what would that be? Because have you found the perfect rate? Well, I definitely like what I do. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's plenty of other good rates out there. I mean, I won't say we're the, the only good one. I mean, EOD's a, that's another great rate as well. Mm -hmm. Seals are, you know, that's a good one. It's a very tough one, but that's a good one as well. The uh, intelligence community uh, seems very interesting to me. Right. So let's talk a little bit about where you're stationed right now. So EOD Group 2, what what do they do? And then how is your rate or, or position supporting that organization? Okay, so EOD Group 2 is a, it's like a higher headquarters command. So they oversee... Uh, several subordinate commands, several uh, EOD mobile units, a uh, support unit, a training unit, and then a mobile diving salvage unit. So our command oversees those those commands I just mentioned. So they're basically the mission here would be to like the man train and equip those said commands. So anything we can do to support them with training, um, you know, instructions. Uh, we do as a diver, we go and do inspections on those those commands. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, get an inspection, you know, checking their dive gear, checking their level of knowledge, um, that kind of thing, that kind of stuff. Um, they're, like I said, they're the, this is the command that would make policy for those subordinate commands. Okay, great. Um, another question is, you know, you don't seem to have an issue with this, but I, I, sometimes our, our cadets want to know because they need to keep themselves busy and focused is how do you motivate yourself every day? How do I motivate myself every day? You didn't know it'd be this personal, huh? But yeah. <laughs> How do you motivate? Because, you know, clearly you this is not one of those rates, you know, especially when you're doing it, that you can take an easy day. So how do you, how do you keep yourself motivated? Well, I'd say here, one of the things I do every morning, I try to get up and go work out. I try to make, you know, try to make that a routine, you know, mm -hmm. get up, beat the traffic, get to work. Right. Get a good workout in to get my day going. You know, after you know, after a good workout every day, you know, you feel pretty good throughout the rest of the day. And that okay. gets you going. So, all I right. Definitely, I definitely recommend all, everyone that's interested in the program to definitely use every opportunity they can for uh, you know enhancing their physical fitness. All right. So, so cadets, get get up early, right? Get those endorphins going. You know, do that PT test, and you'll be fine. Um, Another question is, you know, if, if, you know, and I want to see if I can explain this right, is that you, you've mentioned a couple, uh, you know, challenges that you've done, but you know, have there, 
been anything that you've wanted to do either with diving or with your career or something in the media that, you know, as far as you worked at it, you failed, it didn't work out. And what did you do about it to keep yourself going? Um, I would say there's been some qualifications in the past that I've liked to have gotten, but just the opportunity wasn't there. And maybe the timing wasn't right. Right. Well, during that time, I just realized, you know, if it, if it was out of my control, there was nothing I could do about it. So I just learned to, to move on. I mean, there's still opportunities to get some of those qualifications. So it's not, you know, it's not all lost, but. Okay. Know. All right. That sounds great. So. Another question is, you know, many of our, our cadets, you know, they're thinking about what's next. What's the next steps in their lives? What, what are they going to do? And, and many of them uh, are going to end up in the Navy. So what was your experience with recruit training? Like, were you prepared? Do you know what you were doing? Was it, it, it just overwhelming? What, what was it like for you? I was a, I was a while back, but, uh, I know, right? I, it's, I, it's, I, didn't, it's I, didn't any memory. No? I didn't have any family members that were in the Navy, so I didn't really have, uh, I didn't really have anybody giving me any good gouge on what to expect. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it was a, uh, it was definitely different for me. Yeah. You know? Right. But you know, all in all, I wouldn't say it was bad. It was, you know, definitely a learning experience for sure. <laughs> You you are so kind. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, back to your Hawaii experience. Um, you know, um, everyone knows that the USS Arizona is sacred. Um, when you were doing diving in Hawaii and in, in that area, were you anywhere near it? Oh yeah, it's it's right there. Um, it's right there in Pearl Harbor. It's you can see it every day. I say that was one of the things I wish I would have gotten to do while I was there was make a dive on it. Right. But, you know, like I said, it, it just never lined up. Some guys have gotten that opportunity. Some guys have uh, re-enlisted underwater on the Arizona. I've definitely been there and visited in person, but as far as being underneath it, I've never, I never got to do that. But yeah, it's, it's right there in uh, Pearl Harbor. See it every day. Yeah. It, 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 you know, I, I was stationed out there as well and no, I understand. And it's still leaking oil after all it this is. time. So, um, okay, great. Uh, when you're in high school now, again, we're trying to relate to the cadets, right? So I'm bringing you back to recruit training. I'm bringing you back to high school. Sorry about this, Chief, but this is, you know, we're going way back. Well, not way back. For me, it's way back. For you, not so far. Um, so in, in high school, um, you know, it, you know did, were, you, were you, you know, very studious? Did you get good grades? Did you, you know, did you push yourself there or, or was – you know, you're joining the Navy kind of like reboot phase two of your life. I think the reboot phase two is, would be a, that would definitely be me. I wouldn't say I was, I wasn't a valedictorian or anything like that. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Navy was a, I would say was a good uh, reboot for me. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's a, a lot of people do that as as my daughter who said okay I, i'm off to college so it's time for me to reinvent myself you know you, you can start over again it's no big deal your past is not to take your future that, that's why um so let me see cadets if you have more questions please throw them in here because this is really really great um one of the questions is is there anything besides physical fitness that somebody should practice or be knowledgeable about in your opinion, before they join the Navy? Yeah, if you have, you know, like a basic understanding of physics and, uh, you know, anatomy, that's uh, that's always helpful. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, some, there's calculations you'll do. I mean, it's nothing that you wouldn't already be prepared for from high school. Um, you know, there's portions of school that's going to be dive medicine, so you're going to, you know, the circulatory system, you know, you're going to be going over that, the right. lungs, the heart, you know, you're going to, those things are going to be, uh, going to be covered, you know, those are going to be topics because you do have to know how your body works because in the event something's not right from diving, you need to know what's going on with you. And oh. then obviously everyone else needs to know too, so they can, they can treat you appropriately. So have you, got to that point, have you had any emergencies that you've had to, to work in your diving career with say fellow divers or 
possibly yourself? Uh, fortunately, not myself, but uh, we've definitely, I've definitely done treatments on other divers. We uh, have recompression chambers that you can use to treat diving related injuries. So mm -hmm. uh, I've done those uh, heavily in my career. Some for, some for, you know, diving related illnesses, you can mm -hmm. use them for uh, surface decompression. For when you do deep dives, you come up and you end up back in that chamber for part of your decompression. And then we can also do what's called a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So it's when we put uh, patients in the chamber that, you know, not necessarily a diver, it can be used to treat other things like smoke inhalation, uh, like cyanide poisoning, right. uh, various things, um, injuries. You know, if you have an injury, like a wound that's just not healing, you could, uh, you could get prescribed treatments in a chamber. We've done that before. Really? And those right. would be like, you know, you could be treating the same guy over and over for a month straight every day, you know, to help him huh. get better. So then what happens at that point in time? They, are they there by themselves or some corpsman has to go in with them or how does, how does that work? Yeah, anytime you go in the chamber, they have to have what's called an inside tender. It's a qualified person that goes in the chamber with them. It doesn't necessarily have to be a corpsman. It can be a, a diver that's got that qual that qualification and right. they go in and they'll monitor them. You know, they could give them, you know, you're the one that's going to be administering the oxygen to them, watching for any signs or symptoms of uh, like CNS uh, oxygen toxicity from breathing, you know, too much oxygen is, is also bad. You know, not enough is bad. Too much can also be bad. Okay. You're going to monitor, you know, if it's a diving related injury, you would keep monitoring them to see if they have had improvement, you know, say they had a, a numb spot, but in their leg, you know, mm -hmm. you keep to see if it went away or if they had a pain, you know, or, or right. weakness, a multitude of things that could go wrong. So you could, you could treat them, you know, you're there to monitor them for that. Okay. If they need an IV or anything like that, you'd be there to administer that. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, another question is, okay, so you're, you're in the South Pacific in, in, in that area, and one thing that <laughs> maybe comes to mind is sharks. Have you had to deal with sharks? And are, are they as bad as they seem, or, or that's not really a thing? I've only seen a few in my career, and, I mean, they, they were never bothering me. In Hawaii, I saw a couple, but they would just be, you know, lounging on the bottom didn't right. didn't care that i was there at all i've seen small ones swim by in the past uh, but then again i've been to places where you can't see anything underwater so if there was a shark there i don't know <laughs> maybe there was a big one i didn't see it it's it's better so what if you've run into any of that do you have that initial reaction like whoa or it, you you just well, got ice water in your veins and nothing bothers you <laughs> well i'm sure if one bumped into you it would uh it would get your uh your heartbeat going but like, like i said i've always saw them from from afar they were never that close they were never you know i didn't see like a great white shark or anything like that so okay. it was never it was never a, a real concern okay fair enough so i, I mean i'm looking in that picture on uh, that's with you with that uh you know that the diver with all the fisher in that is that is that common or is or did you guys just stage that picture just for <laughs> i'm not even sure where that picture's from i found that uh, like in stock photos but okay they're, uh, I'm assuming they're somewhere in, they're probably in Hawaii or somewhere in the Pacific. I mean, the water is so clear and to see that, right. uh, that amount of marine life. I've, I've never seen that much around me. Okay. Uh, it looks like they're in an aquarium almost, but. All right. So they're, they're just as happy not to be around you as you are happy for them not to be around you probably. Right. Okay. So we, you know, okay. So I have a question here. Clearly somebody who knows something about diving. All right. So have you ever dived with a Mark V copper helmet? Is that a thing? No, uh, it's, it's uh, the opportunities there. It's just, I think at dive school, they've, they've done it in the past. Um, there's definitely places you can go and pay to do it. What they're talking about is the, the same helmet I was talking about on my, yep. on my uniform, the old, the old, you know, your World War II era um, dive helmet. I mean, they used, the Navy used this from World War II up into that to the eighties actually. Right. Okay. We, we have them at our command. Like we have one, but it's just a, it's just a static display. It doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so you, you make the newbies polish it and that's about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we just have the helmet. Some commands have the whole, they have the suit and everything set up uh, for display. I've put okay. it on before, but I've never had the opportunity to dive it. Okay. It would it work. I mean, it seems like the new equipment is probably, probably far superior to any of the, the previous generations 
it's definitely lighter than the, the Mark V, what we have now. You okay. could, it, I'm sure it's possible with the right adapters to made up to our air systems. It's there, but it's just, right. I don't think uh, there's not a, a need for it. It would only really be for, it was more like, more or less be for fun. So um, <laughs> I'm not saying you could never do it. No, it's, there, there's opportunities. I've had friends that have, uh, that have dove it. Like I said, they dove it at dive school. Right. And at some point, something was going on there that they had them and they were able to do it just in a pool. Like I said, you can pay and go dive in certain places, and um, but uh, no, I've never had that opportunity. Okay, I fair. Was that the opportunity came up. All right, so sorry, uh, person who asked that question. I'll leave that anonymous, but uh, sorry, it didn't work out this way. So if you have, it, I, it appears that you are in a unique club, so that's fantastic. So. Chief, I want to really thank you for being part of our presentation today. Uh, you know, the insight that you've given uh, into the Navy diving program and your career, I think, has been very enlightening. Um, I mean, just I, I I did get a really good sense of what you're doing based upon our discussion. All the you know the, the underwater repair and salvaging and all that stuff. It's 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 pretty impressive. It's it's uh, something I, I you know I didn't really grasp because my background's aviation, but you know for what you folks are doing, uh, it, it's absolutely vital. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. So we like to end our program with the cadets' most favorite question. Okay, so this is their most favorite question, and I want you to think about it. Okay. And then give us your the best answer you can come up with at this moment. All right. So it's not that you're, you know, you're you're a diver. You can handle these types of stresses and pressures, but you know, we'll see where it goes. So here's their one question. All right. So if you were to describe the Navy in just one word, what would that word be? And why? Hmm. One word. I'll stall while you're thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Not as easy as you think, right? But just one word. Well, unique comes to mind. You know, we do stuff that only we do. You know, you can dive in the civilian world. There's commercial divers. There's recreational divers. You'll those people will never dive out of a moving submarine. You know, those those divers will never probably you know dive underneath a submarine. You know, to repair it. Right. So that aspect. Um, definitely unique, you know, right. the average person is not going to travel around the world. They're not going to, you know, like, like I said, living in Japan, that's not an opportunity that everybody could get. So it was a unique opportunity to go do that, live in Hawaii. Um, again, it's not something that everyone gets to do. So no, very true. Say unique, unique would be uh, one word I use to describe it. You know, you are the first person that used that word unique. And I think you chose a real good one. So congratulations. So thank you. Would you do it over again if you had to start from zero and said, okay, um, hey, do you want to join the Navy? Would you go, yeah, I'll do this all over again? I would. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it sounds like you've had so far a great adventure and, and, and you know, I really do wish you a whole lot of success in your continued career. Um, you know, again, fantastic stuff. And on behalf of all, all the Sea Cadets, I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, you know, discuss your background, your history, and, and give us a sense of what you do. So greatly appreciate it. Well, you're welcome, sir. Like I said, thanks for having me. You're quite welcome. So cadets, you know, just to, to wrap this up, if you have additional questions for you who are watching the recorded sessions, write them in the comments section and we'll make sure that Chief has the opportunity to take a look at it and get back to you. Uh, we do that quite frequently. So just because you're not watching live doesn't mean you can't get your questions answered. Speaking of questions, what about the quiz? The quiz URL will be posted in a few moments. So give us a few moments to uh, decompress and we'll get that up there. Take the quiz, reinforce what you learned today and get that two hours, two hours of virtual group credit. It's good stuff. So on behalf of myself, Ensign DePippo, uh, MC1 Quinlan, STG1 Lewison, uh, I'm Warren Officer David Sheets. Thank you very much for attending our session today and we will see you next time for another episode of Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories. Take care, everybody. Have a good evening.